Hello and thank you for joining us for today's masterclass, one of 21 masterclasses in new consciousness, a series looking at new ways of thinking, being and doing in today's rapidly changing world. Of course, all of us have been observing the guidelines that are there for our physical safety, but are we paying as much attention to the spiritual laws which are there to keep us protected and make us feel safe and calm from within? My name is Philippa and I'll be with you throughout this series as we listen to speakers from literally around the world, from all backgrounds and walks of life, as they share with us their navigational tools for coping with this time of challenge and this time of change. I think one of the things that the coronavirus has shown all of us is the way in which our lifestyle actually has an impact, not just on ourselves, but actually on those around us and by implication on the whole world. So put another way, you could say that our lifestyle affects the world. And we have uh, had to think about things not just for myself, but for my neighbourhood. It's about cooperation. It's about working together to tackle something. And it's been striking just how fast this process of change has happened, that we have had to make absolute changes to the way each one of us day to day carries out our life. And what will the long-term effects be of these lifestyle changes? Some of the changes may be we've actually quite liked and we'd like to keep hold of them. Others have, we have really struggled with. Um, so each one of us in our own way is looking at our lifestyle, how that affects us and how that affects the wider community. And our topic today is lifestyle routines that empower. So each one of our speakers is a student and teacher of the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University. As the name suggests, it's a place for learning and understanding about the self, about the soul. It's an organisation that was founded in India in 1936 through a series of visions and teachings that came through the original founder, Brahma Baba, teachings which are geared very specifically to this process, this transitional time that we are all experiencing. And so it feels absolutely relevant to be engaging with this material right now as we're going through what we all are. Um, quite early on, the founder, Brahma Baba, decided that it was important to put women in the front, making the Brahma Kumaris the largest organisation of its kind, spiritual organisation, to be led by women. Uh, and our guide on today's masterclass journey is in fact a woman as well. She's Carolyn Freuder, who has been with the Brahma Kumaris since her late teens, over 20 years ago. So she adopted a yogic lifestyle at quite a young age. She's German, living in Berlin, where she runs the Berlin Brahma Kumaris Center. She also works for a government-funded research institute on sustainability, and she's part of the team that runs the Brahma Kumaris Environment initiative. So from Berlin, Carolyn, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to have you with us for, for many different reasons, which we'll come on to during the course of our conversation. But do you think, looking back, that you were always destined for a spiritual life or was it something that actually came as a bit of a surprise to you that that was the direction your life took? That's an interesting starting point because I wasn't at all looking for uh, meditation or spirituality. My um, driving force was to change the world because I was very aware of the injustice and global um, problems, also environmental problems. Um, and I tried to do something being a political activist, actually. Um, but then I saw how difficult it is and it, I felt quite hopeless after some time to really make a change. That time it was about um, nuclear energy and you know fighting against that. There was a moment where I had a kind of deep realization that there are other possibilities and um, opportunities for change. And um, that was actually during violent uh, demonstration and encounter with a policeman and, and lots of care. So it was quite uh, something. And, but this moment was very important for me because it, it really very clearly showed me that 
there is there are other opportunities, other possibilities um, for making myself and others change. And that's how I slowly um, started to open myself for um, different perspectives for for psychology, but spirituality then mainly. And after a short time, I um, found the Brahma Kumaris and learned Raj Yoga meditation, which then really answered some very fundamental questions in my life. So you were, I think, traveling at the time when, when you met the Brahma Kumaris. Um, what was it about the, that meeting, that, that experience, do you think, that struck such a deep chord for you? What, what do you think really made that impression on you? The main thing which really uh, inspired me was to see how they live it in their practical life. I was um, traveling in India with my sister, uh, backpacking, and then uh, coming to the headquarters of the Brahma Kumaris, participating in the meditation course, and but then had time to kind of um, observe this whole community. Um, there wasn't much going on. It was out of season and not many people around. And I was just watching them. How do they um, combine um, inner work, like um, changing consciousness, practicing certain uh, awarenesses in their day-to-day -day, uh, work? And they do very practical things like... Um, from sewing to cooking to washing uh, all the things which, which you are doing. And there were conferences also for nurses. And I was very much impressed how natural um, spirituality and practical spirituality can be. We've been talking here on the masterclasses about Daddy Janki, who recently died in March 2020. Um, and she was the head of the organization. And I know that she's someone who had a big impact on you. What do you feel you, you really learned from her? Many things. Daddy was someone who, where you had the feeling that she knows you better maybe than you know yourself. And she could see potential in people and address it in such a true and pure way that you also could feel it. And that gave me a lot of um, hope and courage and inspiration to um, get in touch with this unused, um, unconscious potential in me, which she was touching. Um, but she was very, very practical and down to earth which is very important to me she was not kind of some theoretical philosopher wise woman she was very wise but very much in life and in counter in in exchange in relationship with people her approach to life and her um, application of uh, implication of spirituality inspired me hugely and and was always my guiding um, or my an example where I would look up to and, and orientate myself to. Now, for many people, they really have a thirst for acquiring spiritual understanding and spiritual knowledge. But what we're talking about today is how that reflects in our actual life. Why do you feel how we live our life is so important? Why does that matter? Well, I would like to start with a little bit of a bigger picture here um, to... to um, see that it's not about some just routines or some principles or how what to eat it's about that but i i feel it's very important to understand and look at it from a bigger context and that's about lifestyle i mean what is lifestyle um it's very much about the relationship between me as a conscious being and the material and non-material world and um how I interact with this living system, very complex system, which includes other people, it includes um, society, cultures in general, um, the environment, and with that also resources, natural resources. And so um, you can quickly see that everything is connected when you um, <laughs> um, exchange with this um, living system, with the world and with life. Everything what you do matters and, and has an effect. And I think this in itself is a very important awareness that because, I mean, usually, um, at least I was before thinking that, um, well, what I do doesn't matter much in the world, but it does. And um, now having had the experience of coronavirus, we can see how quickly from one country 
something spreads over the whole world and affects life hugely uh, on all continents and corners of the world. And so um, when I uh, think about lifestyle, um, I really think about the awareness as me as an individual a being um, interacting with a very complex system. And so then also um, not only corona crisis but also climate change um, is, is very much understandable that it's connected to how we see the world, how we understand um, the environment. Is it like something like a supermarket which I can just use or is it an, a very um, sensitive system which I can um, disturb and, and bring out of balance with my behavior, with my living uh, the way of the way I live and then yeah it's interesting you talking about um, the environment there because that has been a, you know such a huge issue for the last I don't know 15 20 years but in particular as well the last five years and the whole Greta Thunberg effect of galvanizing young people and really making them see that connection between how they live and the greater world out there. It's almost like your generation inherited a massive problem and you've really grasped the fact that we need to make changes to how we live and we need to make those changes quite fast. So in a way it is your generation that has inspired and led the whole world in taking responsibility for how we live. Yeah, it's known since a long time. In Germany um, we were very much hearing about the Club of Rome in the 70s and um, the environment movement, the Green Party was very alive but somehow these figures and facts didn't really make a difference in, in the living in the system, maybe transport, maybe whatever, uh, in people's day-to-day -day life. Yes, we, we were aware of not using too much plastic and so on but we didn't really um, deeply understand the, how serious it is, it is and how serious we have to take it. And that, I think, has to do with, with consciousness as well. Like, uh, and now, um, lately, in the last maybe five years, um, this has been understood even by politics and scientists that um, it's not only about figures and facts and scenario planning, but it's very much if we want to transform as a society, we need to also look at our value system, at our worldviews, um, as I, what I said in my relationship with the world, how do, do I understand the world? And I, I would say very much this industrialization, our worldview um, changed a lot. Um, and this very mechanical um, understanding of, of production uh, uh, influenced us all. And with spirituality, um, it's very much learning to perceive in a more subtle way again. And there, coming back to lifestyle, one kind of key um, competence, I would say, is really developing um, a sensitive, a, a fine perception for the other person, for the environment, for um, systems, everything around me. Um, that when I'm in an exchange, it's about the relationship, like similar to a human being, am I really feeling how the other person feel about my actions, you know? So um, that's, I would say, a very general and, and or fundamental consciousness which um, is developed by meditation, that you become more aware, more um, sensitive in your perception, and therefore more compassionate, um, like this don't care attitude, um, okay, um, some people are dying or some animals are dying, and, and, but I have my food on my plate, my, my meat and whatnot. Um, like this ignorance, um, this is for me an expression of a lack of perceiving and, and being in touch with the other. There's also an element of, of not just trying to preserve things and maintain what we have got, but actually having a, an entire shift in consciousness and a shift in how we want the world to be. So it's not just making little changes, it's actually about a quantum shift in consciousness and looking to the future and looking to the kind of world, the kind of society that we want to have and understanding that we have to now become the living examples of that future world that we want to see. How do you see what you're doing now in terms of your lifestyle helping usher in a new 
way for the whole of humanity, a new story for the whole of humanity. Yeah, I, I think we have a lot of theory, but very few people who really um, put things into practice. And you mentioned the younger generation who um, do that, who very much focus on, I mean, not everyone, but uh, a, a good amount of people in the movement who are living uh, a plant, uh, like having a plant-based diet or are uh, taking, being aware of not traveling so much and, and so on and, and what to consume and what not. And what is encouraging people is that um, to see people who actually put that into practice, who live that and are happy. <laughs> because, um, you know, a lot of this idea is, oh, I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to go on holiday a uh, few times a year and, and so on. And, and how that's such a loss of, of um, quality of life, but actually it's an illusion. I mean, uh, what makes us really happy is not that we have a certain amount of holidays and, and excitement and, and this and that. It's, it's not. So if you um, prove to your friends around you um, that you are very fulfilled, if you are, uh -huh, uh, without having to use all these external substances, which are actually a form of compensation very often, and then that's very impressive. And I think um, that's also what Daddy Janki was um, very much um, giving to us, a practical, being a practical example and having very high standards for herself and showing us that's possible for a normal human being to have a very deep change. Daddy Janki did set the, the benchmark incredibly high. And I'm, I'm wondering what role discipline, self-discipline plays in, in living some of these lifestyle choices that we'll come on and talk about in just a moment. W would you say that it, it's fundamental if you're going to have a lifestyle that is positive and supportive and empowering, that you have some element of, of self-discipline and, and discipline generally? For me, it's very helpful to have a, like a frame in my life. A frame, I would say, like a, um, some routines which are set, which I know are really helping me. For example, to start the day with meditation um, and to uh, get up early for that so that I have this time and I don't have to look at the watch, uh, how, you know, I have to run off to work or whatever. But I have this time fixed in my timetable where I start with meditation, with looking deeply into myself, how I am, how I feel, and what the qualities of my thoughts are, these kind of things. And to also have certain moments during the day where I uh, get back to that inner part in me to, to check in. But also, um, food has a lot of um, impact on, on our consciousness and our mind. And vegetarian diet, which I adopted before I started a spiritual uh, journey, um, because of the ethical reasons and and the um, harm done to to animals, which I was getting more and more aware of. But then um, I felt that I internally um, felt totally different after um, eating normal, quite quite regular meat, and then suddenly from one day to another not any meat at all. So that um, changed uh, my my inner feeling, but also I found I'm not so reactive anymore. I'm, I'm much calmer. Uh, but I didn't have any clue um, about this at that point. I only understood it uh, a little while later when I then started to meditate and heard about um, how much food is influencing the mind and even how we eat, when we eat, how much we eat and all of that. So that um, is definitely something which uh, supports me a lot to, to take time for uh, cooking, taking my food, you know, the way I prepare food, that it's clean and, and done with mindfulness and, yeah. So you're bringing real consciousness around the whole um, way in which you eat and the energy of, of, you know, your meditation practice is coming into your food and, and so when you eat the food that also supports you, it becomes a sort of a virtuous circle if you like. Um, I'd like to ask you about the whole subject of relationships um, because I know that you're not in a relationship and that you, you've you made that choice because you, you want to to focus more on your practice. Uh, how does that play out for you in, in your life? How does that work? 
Well, that's an interesting topic as well. Generally, relationships, how to live um, or cultivate um, relationships with other people in a way that they're nice, that they're um, joy enjoyable, but not um, causing you pain. And I think it's a big topic in today's world, and especially with young people. But then you are particularly pointing out to a partner relationship, uh, which is another important topic. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, um, I uh, met the Brahma Kumaris for my first time. This is, was something I noticed, like for the first time I was um, experiencing how a man doesn't see me as a woman, doesn't look with me at, at me as a, a young woman, but um, with a lot of respect and a lot of... It was much, much deeper. He was seeing something in me which I was not even aware of as well, again so that that impressed me a lot and i wanted to find out about it when i then heard that um, the raj yoga lifestyle uh, the brahma kumaris teach suggest to um, uh, live a life without um, sex you can say um, i was like what <laughs> you know what's that um, um, because i was educated and, and raised very freely and my mother found it very important to um, educate us very early um, and, and, you know, be, uh, that we could talk about everything with her openly. And so I was first a bit okay. <laughs> but then when I um, took it to myself and, and was really honest with myself, I said, well, um, let me try that out. And that's, that's very, um, if I'm honest, I took, a, it, I did took a lot of so sorrow from having good friends and suddenly um, they are kind of falling in love with you and then the friendship is gone. You lose a friend because it's just something totally different and you cannot go on because the other one always wants something else than you. And it, uh, I felt kind of limited to a, a different person suddenly. So that having had these experiences a lot told me, okay, uh, I will explore that. And... Um, I have to say, I really enjoy it uh, that I can be very close uh, to men and women without uh, and feeling totally safe in the sense that I don't have, have to have extra thoughts, um, you know, on a, on a different level, but I just encounter the other person as a beautiful being, which I love, but I'm not attached to it and I, I'm not allowing someone to kind of cling at me <laughs> in that way. And this is a beautiful way of having you know, cultivating respect with life and other people in general. And then if you see... Uh, but what do you do with those, you know, natural um, feelings of, of wanting to, to love and be loved and, and have intimacy? How do you think you, you have that in your life? Um, well, it's a very important question because um, especially living in a world where this topic is totally differently communicated and um, um, approached or, or told about as it is the most joyful thing in life, um, uh, you are uh, confronted with completely, I mean, big differences. Uh, um, I did it, uh, and I, I worked on uh, or explored it very, very openly and very, very practically. I was literally sitting down uh, in a meditation and then was looking and feeling and comparing <laughs> the different uh, two types of love. I was kind of emerging the love which I understood to be love before, like attraction. And, and then I was emerging the, la the new love I was uh, getting to know more and more, uh, which is about you know loving souls and loving the supreme, loving the divine. And... Um, I was lucky enough to have beautiful meditation experiences quite uh, from the beginning and also divine love, which was totally different to anything which I have ever experienced before. So then I was just comparing and what I first of all recognized is that when I allow this attractive um, love, um, immediately my whole body is tensed. Uh, my mind is tense, but everything in my body is tense and like focused, uh, but not focused in a way that you're in meditation. We also focus, but it's a very peaceful and relaxed state. You are in control. You're an observer. But here you are kind of zoomed and, and um, um, on a hook kind of 
um, yeah. And well, I was just going on with this exploration for quite a long time. I mean, just checking in again and again and then asking myself, what do I want? And does that go together? And I found, no, it doesn't really go together. Either I, um, I really love someone from that soul level or I love someone's body and I'm attracted by that body. And I was always seeing that um, my own, the way I see myself and, uh, is changing in these different um, uh, ways of love as well. I was um, losing self-respect very often if I was attracted. Uh, I was losing myself. Um, but learning to love other people in a way that it's like, in a way it's like children love. It's innocent, it's free, it's open, but it's, it's, you don't want anything. And you don't want the other person to be um, trapped or, or on, your, on your hook, in a way. And it relieves you a lot about thinking about what you wear, how you look like, and, and all the, this. Um, in India, you say Jamela, which goes with it. I mean, the, the long story after uh, connected to it. Yeah. How do you respond to the expectations of your family and your friends and society in general who perhaps have expectations of what it is to be successful in the external world in terms of having a relationship, having a family? How much does that uh, influence you, would you say? Again, it was a long journey, an important journey for me to... Of course, my parents had uh, lots of expectations, uh, as probably all parents have with their children. Um, but in the end, I found that... Um, I have to decide for myself what I want and I have to be honest to myself what really makes me happy. And I cannot just live uh, an idea of another person. And so it was a very um, phase of, well, lots of conversations and explanations to my parents um, why I want to choose this life. And luckily they were open for conversations, even though in another thing they, they were when I started to say, oh, I, I want to live a yogi life, they were afraid that I will not go on with a normal life, having a, a, a you know, going to study in a university or having a, a proper income and a job. And uh, when they saw that um, I do both, uh, I do live a spirit life, but I do uh, also study and I, I have a job and I make my living, then they uh, were um, getting relaxed more. But one day, my mother said to me, um, you know, Carolyn, I cannot live the life you live, but I know you're happy and this is the right life for you. And that, of course, made me very happy because it felt like she could see that um, this is just fitting f for, for me and I'm, I'm, yeah, what I've choose. She could accept that. But then again, you have to always be, I find it, and that was another learning journey as well, um, to make yourself understandable to people who are not interested in inner transformation or meditation and to learn to talk in a way which um, other people can understand. Otherwise, you are again a bit um, in a different dimension or, or come through strange. Yeah. Because I, I know you, you've got a, a twin sister as well um, and you've grown up together. It must have been quite a journey for you to find your own identity within being part of a twin growing up and, and now as an adult too. Yes, that's true. I was growing up in the consciousness of being two, to be honest. Like my twin sister um, in, my, in my childhood, in my youth age, we really looked like very much alike. Even my aunts couldn't uh, differentiate between us. And my mother would address us, even if one is only in the room, as in plural, as if we would be two. <laughs> so that was a quite deep, deep influence or, or consciousness um, and uh, imprinted in me. And, um, but it also, uh, I had to admit that it, it, this was a huge dependency and it, um, it brought me a lot of sorrow. So transforming closeness and... Um, it's beautiful to be so close to someone that you don't have to say much, but you understand each other just with your vision. Um, but I also found, found that um, if she's not well or, or is going through something, 
even though I'm not, I feel bad too. <laughs> Things like that. And when after our school time we moved to different cities, I could see how still this influence was there very much. So actually Daddy Junkie again taught me a lot about attachment and um, being um, independent on being um, detached and loving and how to how that can go together and again it's something of where I work on my own identity I'm not Carolyn in that sense and I'm not the sister of my sister but I'm an individual being and I'm having all these relationships but I'm not my relationships and my sister is not you know part of my identity but she is an individual, independent individual, and like that. And then it, it takes quite some inner work, making yourself understand again and again in in living your whites living your life how how to see things different. But after uh, this journey, I I feel just it liberated me and opened me for so many more um, opportunities to be with people, to enjoy people's company, but not needing them in that way. We were talking earlier about how our own um, way of living affects others and affects the world. What would you say from all these things that you've talked about actually has the biggest impact on, on the world out there as a result of your own actions in your life? Well, um, the key aspect for me would be to learn to fill yourself with whatever you need um, internally love peace happiness meaning there are many fundamental needs every one of us has and to to firstly study how you usually deal with these needs and this is usually to my understanding now um, a compensation like maybe eating, maybe consuming, um, whatever, uh, you know, everything what this world is offering, you know, it's a consumerist society where we are inspired to buy and have and, and do and, you know, many things. But um, to learn to not use these substances or people to make yourself happy, but to get close and get to know yourself and enjoy your own company, be um, getting to know yourself more, so that um, you're free. You can enjoy uh, other people's company. You can even, you know, do things in this world, or you have to do things, but you are not feeding yourself from it. And there, um, a very crucial point, of course, is in meditation to connect with the divine. And the divine, again, often like God is connected with so many concepts. And, and as a Western young person, I was not interested in, in any um, male uh, concept or hierarchical concept. But getting to know this being as a living being, but a beautiful, very sensitive very sweet and powerful partner that can be was uh, enormous for me and so I, I was just exploring this energy and this being uh, also on, very much on that relationship level and and feeling that how this love is is giving me finally what I needed you know and I certainly had a huge lack of love um, um, you know living in a society which is very critical, which is n n usually not looking at what you do good, um, but you know what you are not doing good. But also I felt like this is a longer story. There is a, a deep lack of love inside of me and this holds me back um, in terms of not doing certain things, not being courageous enough, um, don't trusting my, not trusting myself, not being able to speak uh, in front of others and all of these things. And Again, here, Daddy Junkie was um, making me aware of that and in a way, in a very detached way. And that kind of calmed me because now I could see, okay, I just have a lack of love. <laughs> I mean, that's helpful to understand because now I can just do something about it. And uh, when I understood how all the things which are holding me back and limiting me um, are connected to that lack of love, uh, I... I made it a daily routine to 
um, you know, strategically or, or systematically fill myself with that love, connecting to the divine source again and again and experiencing this pure, very true, honest love. And, um, and it changed me to a situation where felt really a different difference in terms of being light, being happy, just being content with, with whatever is. It would be nice just to hear um, your experience of empowerment, because we're talking about all of these um, lifestyle choices that you've made and, and the way you live your life now as empowering you. How, how would you describe empowerment? How, how does that feel to you? Well, two things um, quickly come to mind. First of all, having a mentor uh, who uh, helps you to see yourself beyond your limited vision, who's able to allow you to see you, the bigger part of you. And that, after, yeah, actually immediately inspires you or inspired me to... I want to live that, I want to feel that, I want to be that again. If it's there and I can feel it too, and this person is even, you know, uh, seeing it in me, I want to become that. It's like a, a longing which is awakening. And that's a very positive energy. It's not a must or a discipline kind of thing, but it's something which you start to love and you, you, you long for. Um, generally, empowering is the whole aspect for me of being a self-led person, like being in charge of my own decisions. I'm listening to my family or the society, but after all, I have to make a decision which is free from what other things, which is only based on my rational understanding uh, or, or spiritual understanding, whatever I learned, um, and not because someone else wants me to do something. Or this is what everyone else does. does. And this attitude or this consciousness in itself and awareness that I am and I have to be my own master, I feel is very empowering because the more you then um, make experiences of your own decisions and the good outcome of it, or even also failures, and to accept that I can take the responsibility for my failures, that's okay, was another journey, another big topic to accept and understand that it's okay to make the, uh, mistakes. But that is, uh, um, in, in education you call it self-efficacy, like the, the effect you have yourself, that you can move something. And that's a very, very fulfilling um, experience. Sounds to me a little like you are describing a state of freedom. Would you go along yeah, with that? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Because you're in a place where you are, are literally being your own person, free to, to choose and to be as you see it. Right. And even the freedom to accept um, my limits at this point in time. You know? Um, because I always was, uh, for a long time, also discontent with myself that I'm not better yet on my journey and to accept, to learn to accept and be free and, and, and easy about where you are at. But yeah, the, the general aspect of independence in the sense of freedom, um, and it is totally different to, well, it doesn't matter, I just do what I want. It's not that. It's, it's um, a very conscious and based on a responsibility you take for yourself and for your life uh, decision. Well, it would be lovely if you could lead us into a meditation before we have to close um, to really experience this, this quality of, of empowerment, this feeling of freedom that you're talking about and, and this, this place that you've arrived in your life where, where you have got a degree of mastery over yourself which is allowing you to sustain and support this, this life which, which you are now living. If you could just take us into a meditation to experience some of those qualities, that would be perfect. Thank you. Yeah, happy to do that. So just sit comfortable and relax. I breathe deeply. And gently 
turn towards myself. I become aware of myself as a spirit of being, a conscious being. I connect with my inner peace and open myself to get to know myself better. I even develop the interest to get very close to myself and connect with my inner self, my spiritual identity, this being which feels authentic. I visualize myself as a being of light sitting behind the eyes I perceive myself sitting on my soul seat stable in the middle of my head totally present. But also calm and relaxed. From here I observe my relationships to human beings, to nature, the world in general. I am constantly in exchange with life. What is the quality of my exchange? And can I act while staying in this awareness I am now? independent individual and free. I have the ability to understand and decide on the basis of what's good for all. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you for all your wisdom that you have shared with us today, uh, the journey that you have been on with really exploring and experimenting ways of living that are not only going to empower yourself but really make a difference out there in the world. You've given us so much to think about. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for this conversation. And thank you for joining us as well. I hope you'll be able to be with us tomorrow for our next Masterclass series. Until then, take care, keep safe, Om Shanti, and goodbye.
21 masterclasses in new consciousness, new ways of thinking, being and doing for the new you. Pioneering thinkers from countries right around the world.